Hey, what's up, guys? And welcome to episode 71 of Talk 4, the quickfire podcast where we ask four great questions to unique and interesting people. Behind the mic today is your host, Louis Scoopian. That's me. And let me introduce our special guest for today, Rob Sweetman, who's going to be answering some questions today. Rob, welcome aboard the Talk 4 podcast, man. Please say hi to the fine people listening and just give us a quick rundown of who you are and what you do before I shoot some questions. Thank you for having me, Louis. Uh, hello to everyone out there. Um, I am Rob Sweetman. <clears throat> I was in the military, which we're going to talk about a little bit, I think. And now I'm a sleep scientist. So I can explain how that all happened. Doesn't really make 100% sense uh, to say it out loud. But now I help people with their sleep. I had my own sleep problems. Um, so I'm very passionate about that. So happy to dig in. Absolutely. Yeah, this has been a podcast that uh, I've I've really been looking forward to. I've had so many pressing questions about the subject of sleep and and you're obviously a really interesting guy too. And you've been through the ringer and the seals and hell weekend. Look at you now. You're doing fantastically. So I can't wait to ask a few questions. If you're good to go, man, do you want to jump into question number one? Yeah, send it. All right, let's do it then. So to kick it off, let's wind back the clocks a bit then. So tell us about your backstory. So what was your motivation to become a Navy SEAL? How tough was Hell Week for you? And guide us through your service history. Oh, well, Hell Week was very easy. I just took the online course. Um, that was an option when I joined. Right. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> I was like, wow. No, okay. <laughs> right. Uh, it, you know, it's the hardest military training in the world. That's what they say. Hmm. Who knows? Maybe there's something out there we've never heard about that's harder. But that has an appeal to it, doesn't it? You know, the hardest, um, the best. And so, you know, those were some of the things I was thinking about uh, when I made the decision to join the Navy. Um, I had already kind of cut my teeth in business. I was an entrepreneur, um, did a lot of great things as an entrepreneur. But a lot of them were all about money or self-serving and really didn't serve our country right now. We're, you know, talking across the pond right now um, as it was. But I think that we can both agree that there's something about uh, defending freedom. Right. And for me, I, I've always felt like uh, I was a patriot. I always felt like <clears throat> I had this warrior spirit deep down inside of me. And when I got out of high school, uh, I gave my first shot at college and then went into entrepreneurship. I really wasn't um, following that passion. And so it wasn't until 29 years old that I made the decision. So I went, I signed up at 28 was a cutoff without a waiver. So I signed the dotted line at 28. And by my 29th birthday, I had arrived in Coronado to complete the BUDS training, the hardest training in the world. Um, so what was it like? <clears throat> it, it was hell. Uh, I won't lie to you, man. Um, most human beings are not cut out to, to endure this level of suffering. Um, it was definitely a gut check. You know, they say, how do you prepare for a kick in the nuts? Right. And there's no way to prepare for that. You, you just have to take it as it comes. And it, that's the same way that um, you prepare for buds, right? You, you just can't prepare for what's about to come. And I say that because, you know, we had Olympic athletes. We had dudes that could do 50 pull-ups, uh, run extremely fast in the sand. You name it. Athletes from all over the world that instantly failed. Instantly. I mean, I'm talking within minutes of uh, starting the training. Wow. And the, the reason why is because, um, well, there's a ton of different reasons why everybody has their own reason, but some of the big reasons are that um, it's harder than you ever could have imagined. And they say that, uh, you know, the human mind and the body um, can take 10 times what you think it can. Um, I thought that was a joke, uh, but no, that's, that's very, very real. Um, so the first thing is people have, you know, a lot more put on them than they were expecting. Um, so they quit. Another reason is that that water out there in Cordado is cold. And when you touch that cold water, um, you may quit the first time. It may take a few times of dipping in that water. It may be nighttime when there's no sunlight, uh, and that water you're, you're chilling out in that cold water. That's what gets you. 
a lot of people um, face injuries. I've seen a ton of neck injuries, hip injuries, shoulder injuries, um, as well as um, MRSA and uh, sepsis from um, maybe not as much sepsis, but um, uh, what's the internal lung disorder that uh, the one Bud student died from recently? I can't remember the name, but either way, um, he got an infection in the lungs. I mean, this is some serious stuff here. Um, your body is, is being totally destroyed in every way. Like your immune system is as low as it can possibly be. Your morale is very low. Your body is going through physical exhaustion. You have injuries in every, every part of your body. And just to throw a little icing on the cake, you have sand in every orifice of your body. Oh, I mean, God. I had sand in places that you can't imagine, right? <laughs> sure um, <I> can. <laughs> you, you might can try to imagine, uh, but there's, there's orifices that you didn't really know existed um, <laughs> or new, new orifices that you're creating through cuts and scrapes and bruises. Mm. Um, one thing that was kind of uh, challenging was the chafing the chafing of uh, sand in the wounds between your legs and your armpits and stuff like that. Mm. It hurts and it's not a life threatening hurt. It's like this stings, it burns, you jump in the ocean, it relieves the pain for five seconds and then the salt gets into the wound and then it makes it worse. Um, so a lot of inflammation, just sheer terror and horror and the, the reason why we do this is because um, we want to be a part of the most elite tactical unit in military history. That's why we do it, right? We want to be a part of the best. Um, but I think once you get out there and you feel that cold water and you feel the pressure over time, um, you have to dig even deeper than that. It really has to be a spiritual connection to your path. Um, whether it's the SEAL teams or uh, SBS in the UK or the Marine Corps uh, here in the United States, um, whenever we face these, these really gut-wrenching challenges, um, the people who persevere are, are likely to be people that have a, a deeper purpose beyond just, hey, I, I want to have this title. You you have to earn that title, and there has to be something deep within you that wants it. So I hope that answered your question. Certainly did, and I mean it just sounds from the descriptions like it's just absolute. Well, as the name implies, sounds like absolute hell. But I don't think anyone could really imagine that until they're actually there, being put through that kind of a thing. But so if we talk about the sleep side of it, then I think I read or I heard that during Hell Week you're kind of getting around like an hour and a half to three hours of sleep every night. Is that about right? Or kind of like how brutal is that on the sleep and how affecting no. is that to the performance? No, it's way worse. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So <clears throat> hell week is five and a half days straight of training. So you get to Sunday and I'll be honest, I, I'm a knucklehead and I didn't read the books. I didn't follow up on any of the, I, I really didn't know how bad hell week was going to be. I was, it was Saturday night and I was still playing poker with my brother, staying up late, having fun, not a worry in the world. Um, I didn't realize that we were going to get no sleep and that it was going to be as crazy as it was. I was like, I thought it was, you know, sure. It's hard, but whatever I signed up, I'm going to do whatever I can tough it out. And I did. Um, so I don't know if knowing, beforehand would have helped but i definitely didn't show up like fully charged like with great sleep um so as hell we kicked off on sunday we show up to the uh there's like this building that we all showed up to and we went in and we kind of um i think we must have had you know like our little sleeping mats there and we're all kind of you know chilling out i think we ate a big meal together and we're in this building and we're waiting on hell week. And so it's Sunday night. Um, kickoff is going to be, I think at midnight, if I recall, this has been 15 years ago, but, um, so we're all there waiting and we're in this pace. <clears throat> we're in this place, um, standing by, standing by to stand by. Right. And I think it must've been 11 o'clock or so. And they 
they walked us out to the beaches and some Alaska tents and we all got into our cots and it was, uh, I think it was midnight. We had breakout. And so breakout was, you know, simul simulation grenades, um, rapid, you know, blank fire, like automatic weapons, M4s, all blanks. It's not real. It would not be a good idea for there to be live rounds. Um, but it's meant to be very loud and chaotic, right? It's the middle of the night. You're already kind of tired. So you have to kind of get out of bed and <clears throat> start low crawling through the sand. And now you're low crawling into the asphalt, into the buds compound. They're spraying you with water and you have to do jumping jacks and start, you know, push ups. And you're really excited. You're so excited to be there um, for those first few hours, right? But then 12 hours passes by. 24 hours passes by you've waved goodbye to the sun as the instructors mock you and it gets cold and then you see the sun come back up and this goes on for five and a half days um nice. now to your point yeah you said 1.5 to 3 hours uh, a night i think is what you said there is some truth to that so on wednesday night now you know so you start midnight on sunday so really monday um, on Wednesday afternoon and Thursday afternoon, they give you either an hour or 90 minute nap. And the reason why is because uh, doctors have figured out that um, there's some critical systems within your body that will start to shut down and you may die if you don't get this quick reset. But let me tell you, uh, those two resets, there's a reset on Wednesday and Thursday. I, I know now as a sleep scientist that, that is actually very important, but um at the time, we don't know. We're just doing what we're told, right? And so you yeah. go from this 90-minute nap, where which, trust me, you you want to go to sleep. You're very tired. You're like, oh, my God, thank God. So you lay down, and in an instant, that time has gone by. And you're getting woken up. Imagine, you know, cuddling up with your pillow. Oh, you know. You're not prepared. You're not mentally prepared. Like you, you show up to work, you've had your shower and a shave and boom, you're ready, mentally focused. No, you're waking up like when your mom wakes you up and guess what happens? Hit the surf, hit the surf, get wet and sandy, start all over again. That is a nightmare. That is a thing that uh, nightmares are made out of uh, waking up straight out of maybe you're having a dream or whatever. So that was not fun. That was very very disturbing everything about it was disturbing um so you're getting back into the water uh freezing cold shivering and uh so yeah five and a half hours with three hours total sleep um sorry five and a half days with three hours total sleep and if you make it past the the physical injuries if you're lucky enough not to have a, a life-threatening injury or a severe break in one of the bones or something like that that just precludes you from finishing the course um it takes more willpower and sheer grit uh to make it through this training than i think most people can ever perceive going into this i mean you, you look at all of the guys you go through basic with all of the guys you go through pre-buds with you show up for indoctrination you're all hungry ready you've been training for years for this moment Everybody promises to make it with you. Dude, we're going to make it together. I swear to God, I'll be there with you. Like we're brothers through this. Everyone is gone. Everyone. Everyone, man. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's like average is 25 or 30% make it through this, through the buds class training. Once you have actually made it there, which is, you know, tons and tons of people drop in between start to finish before you even get to the day one of buds um most people get lost through hell week but it's it's a little bit depressing all of your friends are gone uh you've made it through this crazy chaotic training your brain is probably um messed up a little bit from that um bridging the dream world and the real world um through this extreme sleep deprivation no one knows the uh the negative consequences of that um long term we do know we have a problem with suicide in the teams um that's something that we're trying to attack from the sleep perspective uh 
but yeah, so you can say that that was really my first um, major injury in in sleep, and then there would be more follow-on injuries um, or, or long-term sustained habitual injuries uh, throughout my Navy career that would lead me to have sleep problems and lead me to want to transition to this sleep scientist role that I have now. Right. Okay. So let's move on to that then. So for question two, exactly about this then. So can you tell us about what happened with your sleep then in the teams and then obviously give us a bit of info about how you became a sleep scientist and fix those problems afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. My sleep got worse and worse through the teams for a ton of different reasons. At, at some point I developed obstructive sleep apnea, uh, which has a, you know, military in general has a really high percentage of, uh, obstructive sleep, sleep apnea symptoms way higher, like three, four five times as high as uh, civilian counterparts, which begs the question, uh, what, what is the cause of, of OSA? Um, the medical community does not have good answers for this, mm -hmm. at least that they all agree on. I have my own hypothesis, but, um, so anyways, there's a little bit of that. Um, but I would say that most of it's behavioral. So going through the teams, doing nighttime missions, having a watch cycle, that's all jacked up, switching between daytime and nighttime. And, you know, I'm not complaining. There's people in the military that had it way worse than me. Um, when we do an analysis of the five and dime watches on ships on the, the Navy fleet ships, um, those are terrible. Um, other people probably have had it worse. Uh, I'm not complaining, but my personal experience was terrible. Uh, sleep, not only, not only was I not getting sleep, but the culture surrounding sleep was not conducive to ever getting full recovery. I mean, the, the culture was more of pro sleep deprivation. It's like, oh, it's a badge of honor that you didn't get sleep and you went out and went on a mission or you operated um, without that sleep. Right. And to now, like in hindsight, it's like, that's so bizarre because that's completely backwards. Like you want to have good sleep to be able to have better human performance, cognitive function, uh, physical recovery and all that. But that's just not how it works. Like when you're with a bunch of guys in this group dynamic, they tend to feed off of each other and they just, uh, they, they heckle each other and they, they call each other weak. If they get too much sleep, it's like, Oh, sleepy baby, you need some more sleep. Wah, wah. And this type of shaming. Right. So I would say that, you know, the op tempo, uh, the nighttime missions, the crazy watches, all of this led to me creating bad sleep behaviors, bad behaviors during the night, uh, daytime that led to bad behaviors at nighttime. And so I take full ownership of that. And people who are suffering with this now in military first response have to take ownership of it because there's bad influence, but ultimately it is up to us to manage our schedule and our sleep patterns. So I was struggling with sleep for those reasons. And then in 2017, I had a buddy who committed suicide, Ryan Larkin. My you know, impression of the whole thing was that Ryan was not sleeping. He was not sleeping. And when he was sleeping, he was using Ambien or alcohol to go to bed. And we know that sedative induced sleep, that's not real sleep. And then you wake up feeling like crap and you're using monsters and coffee and energy drinks or whatever to, to stimulate, to try to like make it through the day. And my, my thought process was that I thought there was a relationship between mental health and sleep health. And it, it wouldn't be until years later in graduate school that I would identify that there absolutely was a very strong relationship between sleep health and mental health and physical health and everything. Um, sleep was such a big part of the entire health continuum. But at the time, I, uh, Ryan Larkin, his death made a huge impact on my life. I actually thought about suicide at that point. And I thought, what if... I am next. Like I thought Ryan was a better Navy SEAL, a better team guy than me. What, why did he do this? And am I next? And I know that sounds silly to say out loud, but it's a real thought process that I went through. So <clears throat> I didn't go down that path. Thank God. Right. Um, my, my way of making 
this, his death have a meaning was to dedicate my life to sleep. I found out that, yeah, Ryan's sleep did impact his mental health. There's other stuff, right, uh, that he was dealing with. But I dedicated my life to sleep science because I wanted to not only improve myself, but also to help my brothers that were struggling with sleep. A ton of people struggling with sleep. In our surveys, like 98% of the team guys are reporting terrible sleep. We expand that to the Navy, the RAND report on sleep in the military. It's a huge problem. And now I do work with uh, first responders. In some situations, it's even worse. So right now, we have an epidemic of sleep deprivation in veterans and first response. And in the civilian sector, it's actually a global problem, especially in first world countries. And so there's no shortage in work for me. Um, one of the things that, that differentiates me from other sleep scientists um, is that I have this background, right? Uh, I would say that at least three quarters, if not more, of my colleagues are female that come from a place of love, um, that really understand this topic. But for some reason, having a knuckle dragger guy who has been through the ringer as a Navy SEAL <clears throat> and been through all of this stuff resonates with people. So they actually listen to my story and they say, hmm, maybe I should really think about improving my sleep health. So that's what brought me here today. Absolutely. And I, I do personally believe as well that military guys and veterans, they command a very different kind of respect and attention that a normal civilian wouldn't get. And that's from my experience and what I've seen from other people like ex navy seal that has a lot of weight behind it because you know exactly what the kind of person has to be to get through that sort of a thing so they do derive a lot more respect um before we move on to the third question i want to ask just just touch on something that you mentioned there as well um if i <laughs> if if i asked you to be detailed about this we'll, we'll probably be here for a few a few hours I, i'd imagine but just to summarize it so if we talk about alcohol versus sleep how bad actually is that and how effective is alcohol on killing that sleep routine for you? You said it's it's not real sleep. So if you were just to summarize it for people listening, like the civilians and stuff who are kind of going out on the weekends and wondering why they don't feel rested, like how much alcohol does it take to destroy the sleep? And just give us a bit of info about that. Yeah. So sedative induced sleep is uh, not real sleep. We say that all the time because uh, there's a ton of people who are on sedatives to go to sleep. Um, none of these have ever been tested long term. None of them um, have shown significant um, improvements on sleep over placebo. Um, mm -hmm. Alcohol is one of those that it's a sedative, but it is so culturally acceptable. It's promoted everywhere in the United States, and I'm sure the UK, everywhere, that you should drink alcohol every weekend, you should party, you should buy this alcohol, and you should just have a part of it. I don't drink. Um, I did have a problem with alcohol in the past. I overcame that. Um, so in terms of how it impacts your sleep, alcohol not only um, is, is going to cause a ton of problems with your sleep, um, but it can cause uh, awakenings, it can cause interruptions, it can cause <clears throat> you know, degraded performance within deep sleep and REM sleep. Uh, primarily though, we look at the deep sleep and we're seeing that if, um, if you are going to sleep with alcohol in your system, um, that some of the critical processes of recovery within the brain, within the muscles are not able to function fully and um, a lot of times we're just not going to get that recovery. And so you wake up feeling like crap and you wonder, um, oh, well, it's just a hangover. But, you know, you really haven't gotten some critical processes uh, to work during sleep. And that's a big deal. So, you know, I'm, I'm a pragmatist. I'm a realist. I get it that people are not all going to live a very strict and disciplined life like me. That's okay. Um, if you're going to go out and have a couple of drinks with your friends on the weekend, um, let's talk about how that, you know, how we can sort of mitigate the impact on your sleep. First of all, we have to acknowledge that sleep is important. And once we do, you know, it, it's part of every aspect of the health continuum, right? Um, your work, your immune system, which is how much you get sick, 
um, how much you're going to lay out of work, but it also impacts your personal relationships, um, even emotional intelligence. I can tell you through sleep deprivation that, um, you know, the level of someone's ability to read facial expressions in um, one-on-one situations, uh, specifically with uh, law enforcement and military, uh, not only is it degraded with sleep deprivation, but it is so important to their career and making the decision to take someone's life uh, in, in a crazy situation. Like I can't imagine being sleep deprived and being on shift uh, with the, the responsibility of having to make that decision. Um, but if, if we look at like, okay, how can we mitigate some of the effects of uh, alcohol in our sleep? Well, let's try to, and I know this is a tough one, right? Cause the bars stay up until two. Let's try to stop drinking with enough time to get the alcohol out of our system before we go to sleep. Some techniques that might help out are switching between alcohol and water. Um, you know, kind of alternate if, if you're drinking all night and that can absolutely help hydrate uh, your system and help uh, reduce the amount of alcohol that you're consuming. You know, they always say two drinks is cordial. Um, I know in my college days and in the teams, I mean, we would drink bottles of liquor. I mean, there was just no uh, limit to that. So if people are struggling with alcoholism, that is, you know, drinking in excess, that is a problem in itself that really you should take a hard look in the mirror and, and just try to stop that because the, the cultural norm of alcohol is okay. It, it's not okay, right? Maybe you have a little bit here and there, but not drinking to ex excess. So if you're struggling with drinking to excess and potentially alcoholism, that is a subject, you know, you should probably get that looked at. But if you're just a casual drinker, two or three drinks a night, then what we want to do is give yourself a few hours before bed uh, after you finish that drink, that last drink, and then maybe alternate some water. Yeah, great points. Um I mean, I, I find it amazing, to be honest, because some of the other kind of veteran foundations that I'm talking to have contact with and work with. Obviously, they, they're kind of starting to use these class one, schedule one drugs as therapeutic use things. And you look at the actual definition of a schedule one drug, and that's high rate of addiction, no therapeutic use. Isn't that literally just the definition of alcohol and cigarettes and stuff? Um, but the the acceptance around that is just it's shocking and you and you're the weird one or the odd one out if you're not doing that especially in kind of friendship groups and universities and stuff and I can imagine like you said even in in the teams and all that but let's talk about then society where we're at now because this is a, a big subject and obviously like the alcohol comes into that hell of a lot but you know I believe that a massive 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 I know especially people my age um majority of the of the world is sleep deprived um I truly think that if everyone had better sleep, then there would be way less car crashes, less accidents, less human errors, mistakes at work. The list just goes on. It's endless. I honestly truly believe that. Um, as a society, how bad do you think the sleep deprivation is in this day and age? And what do you think are the top negatively and con contributing factors towards that? And how can we start to fix that? That is a super big question. Um, I'll say that, you know, the, the comments that you just made are statistically factual. Um, sleep deprivation is an epidemic, uh, both from short sleeping or shift work or uh, not getting adequate sleep for a number of different reasons, specifically in first world countries. It is a big deal. I mean, like in the U.S., we're talking like a third of the country is not getting adequate sleep. And so, yeah, that increases your risk of uh, getting in a car accident and not living a full uh, lengthy life. Uh, it, it decreases your ability to be on point at work. Um, it increases the number of sick days that you're going to have. Um, I think the it's BCC research that publishes um, the uh, economic loss. Um, I think they do globally, but in the United States, it's something like $400 billion in lost um, earnings for businesses because or, or due to um, productivity, right? Not necessarily earnings, but um, loss in their finances due to um, sleep deprivation or uh, sleep related issues. And how they get that number is that when people are not getting enough sleep, 
the number of people who are laying out of work, um, not being productive at work, getting sick and not showing up to work increases. Um, it's really an issue. So uh, in the civilian sector, uh, we're looking at like a third of our country, right? When you look at veterans and first responders, um, specifically in a post-COVID first responder world, um, these numbers are out of control. Like extremely high percentages of these uh, groups of people are struggling with sleep. Then we go back to the link to mental health. Um, if you're not getting adequate sleep, there's a direct correlation to mental health. It's a bi-directional relationship. Does the mental health cause poor sleep? Does the poor sleep cause mental health? It's both, right? Um, but what we do know is that um, if veterans and first responders are having poor sleep uh, at alarming rates right now, uh, above uh, what any civilian is suffering with right now. And they also have um, a significantly larger um, suicide problem. Um, we, we know that one is connected to the other, right? And so what we're seeing, I'll, I'll quote uh, Dr. Gaurav Mishra, who works with us. He's a MD psychiatrist here in the US, here in San Diego with me. Um, he will say that it really doesn't matter short of like schizophrenia major depressive or bipolar like it doesn't really matter what prescription he gives the patient if the sleep doesn't improve typically the symptomology will not improve right but if the sleep improves regardless of what medicine he gives them uh, the mental health will improve just as a, as a general blanket statement um, so what we're seeing is that if we can improve sleep health with um, veterans and first responders. And I am starting to dive into civilians and help them as well. Uh, but if we can improve the sleep health, we can improve the mental health. If we improve the mental health, we're living in a better world, all of us together. And then uh, subsequently, we can reduce those suicide rates. Absolutely. So true. And one of the kind of things, so from the stuff I've seen about sleep and advice I've heard kind of around the internet, obviously you can't always trust these sources and everything. Definitely not, especially nowadays, but something that I kind of wanted to learn a bit more about as well is what's the kind of the truth about napping and taking power naps. I've always wondered because people always have a lot of good stuff to say about it with the kind of the energy things and, and kind of refreshing yourself throughout the day. But I've always been kind of it's always been in the back of my mind thinking does this detract from my main sleep at night so I'm just wondering what's the kind of the truth there or the final verdict in your opinion yes it does detract from your sleep at night in one regard uh, but it can also support your overall daily sleep it's a personal choice um, uh, optimally we want to get the majority of our sleep at night time optimally for shift workers. Sometimes they have to get that sleep period during the daytime. Um, we just have to do the best that we can with what we have. So the first um, type of sleep that we understand in terms of sleep scheduling would be a uh, monophasic. So that would be one sleep period, right? Uh, National Sleep uh, Foundation says, you know, maybe that should be seven to nine hours, right? We all have heard eight hours of sleep, right? It's the target. Yep. Well, truthfully, it's different for everybody. Uh, it really is. And you should find out how much sleep you really need. Uh, and then that should be your target. You shouldn't need eight hours of sleep because somebody else told you, uh, you should seek out that number. So then we look at, at biphasic sleeping. So that would be two phases of sleep in one day. Uh, so what that might look like is a siesta, right? And we know that humans have a dip after lunch, right? And some people say, oh, what's food coma? Maybe it's enzyme production causing drowsiness, but that dip actually happens whether or not we eat lunch or not. There's a natural dip uh, that happens around 2 p.m. if we're on a normal sleep uh, schedule. And so many countries and cultures have done the siesta or done the biphasic sleeping uh, for much of recorded history. And we've kind of gotten away from that and condensed it back to the monophasic sleeping because we have most of us live in this um, very fast paced world of like, you know, buy, sell, go to work, produce, you know, come home, see your kids, you know, play all the sports and be a participant of everything in life and just go, go, go. Uh, and we don't give ourselves time to take that siesta or to get that downtime. 
So when we look at napping, that would be one type of napping, right? It would be the, um, and so that, that second sleep period, um, your siesta might be an hour. Um, so that is a nap. Now, whether or not you take a nap every day uh, is a personal choice. It doesn't have to be at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. It can be whenever you want. But we need to think about the impact of that um, as it pertains to uh, your overall sleep. So the point of, you know, naps damaging sleep, that's true because what we have is an adenosine buildup uh, in our brain, right? So adenosine is a byproduct of the energy process. And so our brain has the brain has these receptors to detect the volume of, of adenosine that we build up. So the minute that you wake up, you start, you know, accumulating this adenosine and it, it doesn't, uh, you don't really have an adenosine dump until you take a nap or go to sleep. So the adenosine acts as sleep pressure, right? That's the whole point. So you feel this overwhelming pressure from the adenosine. And after about 20 hours, it can cause micro naps. It can cause drowsiness. It can cause all of these, um, you know, things that we so associate with uh, sleepiness, right? So if we take a nap and we dump that adenosine, then we won't have the same adenosine buildup and the same sleep pressure from adenosine when it's time to go to bed at nighttime. Now, is that good or bad? Well, it depends, right? Because if we're going to have a, a full eight hour sleep period at nighttime, then we don't need a nap. But if we're, let's say a first responder and we're only getting four five, six hours of sleep, it may be critical to get that nap throughout the day. And there's plenty of sleep pressure uh, to build up to the sleep period at nighttime. Um, the one thing that I'll recommend, whether you choose to have a nap or not, is to just be consistent with it. The best thing uh, to promote good hormonal function, which is, is a very big part of, of going to sleep in, in the recovery process, is be consistent, right? Like if you're going to take a nap, um, do it daily. Build it into your routine. If you want to take a nap at 10 a.m., great. If you want to take a nap at 2 p.m., great. Uh, but try to do that consistently. And then when you go to bed, same thing, try to go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time. I know that's not possible all the time, but the more consistent you can be, the more your body can expect that, the more your circadian rhythms will be in sync uh, and the better result that you'll have from the sleep that you do choose to get. I see. Yeah, that that's really good info. I've always kind of thought about that. It's like how impacting is a sleep in on the weekend? And the stuff that I've always heard about that is that, you should always try to go to bed at the same time, try and wake up at the same time every single day, regardless. So that's kind of what I've heard about it. But so just one more little bit on this subject. So is it possible to oversleep? Like, is there a is there a time or a certain kind of part in your body? Obviously, it's individual to everyone where it's actually going to have like a negative impact. Or can you literally get as much sleep as you want and need and then that's brilliant so i'm just wondering if you do get that eight hour out eight hours of sleep and then you want to have like a couple of power naps in the day is there like a point where you're getting too much sleep and then that's negative or literally is it just get as much as you can sort of a thing yeah so yeah you can get too much sleep um if you're getting eight hours of sleep at night time you probably don't need to take a nap uh, throughout the day, because if you take a nap throughout the day and then you don't really feel sleepy at nighttime, you're not able to get adequate sleep. Not only could that impact some of the, uh, the functions that we're looking for in that main sleep period at nighttime, but it can also be a slippery slope of, uh, confusing this insomnia with the lack of need for sleep. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a little bit of recovery for, uh, during that nap period. And then maybe you can't sleep that much at nighttime. And then you're thinking like, well, geez, I can't get sleep. There's something wrong with me. And this rumination actually turns into a cycle that can cause even more insomnia, right? So most likely we're, you know, if, um, if we're feeling rested, we're getting enough sleep and we don't need naps. If you prefer naps throughout the day, um, like my father, he swears by him, then you don't actually need as much sleep at nighttime. So one thought is, is if you only get six hours of sleep at nighttime and then you take a nap, 
30 minutes or an hour and a half. Those are the two uh, napping timeline strategies. Um, then you're probably okay, right? I'm like a seven and a half hour, seven, 15 hour, uh, a seven hour, 15 minute sleeper. I know that that's where I function optimally. Uh, but studies show that um, anything less than about seven hours, definitely less than six hours, can start to have some really damaging effects on your body. Uh, there's a direct correlation to the development of cancer and hypertension and just a number of different issues. But what happens if we get too much sleep, if we're starting to hit nine hours of sleep uh, per night? And what we've seen is that um, that is also bad. Like once you hit about nine hours, uh, we start to see increased rates of obesity and uh, other health issues um, that we you know, you wouldn't normally think that getting too much sleep might cause, but yeah, it is actually bad. So there's a, there's a bell curve. And if, you know, short sleeping is on one side, oversleeping is on the other side. Um, both can have negative effects. Uh, this is something that anybody can begin doing research on right now. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out is that um, banking your sleep on the weekends is not the best idea. Um, it's not like a savings account where you can spend it throughout the week and then plus it up on the weekends. That doesn't really work uh, because we fall into the same issues of like, okay, our body needs, you know, seven, eight hours of recovery um, through sleep. Getting those additional hours on the weekend doesn't actually trigger any additional recovery response. It's just sleeping around more. Now you may get a little bit more recovery, but the damage that you've done throughout the week by short sleeping can't be recovered by oversleeping on the weekend. Wow. That is fascinating because I've always been under the impression that, well, I've always known that there's a thing called sleep debt, which I'm sure you know a hell of a lot about. And I always kind of had this this sort of curios curiosity towards it, almost wondering if there's if there's a sleep debt that's possible. Is it possible to have sleep credit yeah. as well? That's really interesting. No. <laughs> that's a misleading term. Yeah, sleep debt is real, and you know, you know, there's rebound effects that can happen from sleep deprivation, but these are processes that your body will automatically seek, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not a good idea to sleep deprived throughout the week and then bank your sleep on the weekend. Um, if you're not getting good sleep and you get extra sleep on the weekend, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Yes, get as much good sleep as you can whenever you can. Some people don't have the opportunity to get adequate sleep. That's just their career choice or their life situation. So I encourage those people to just do the best that you can. Uh, but if it's a, a willing choice to sleep deprived throughout the week, you're not going to be able to, um, th that that's still going to be damaging to your body uh, throughout the week, no matter what you do on the weekend, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. 100%. No, that's fascinating. I've learned that a lot from that. Um, so last question, then kind of a personal one. Um, I'm going to use myself as the example. But really, this question is aimed at anyone who's in a bad sleep routine. So for me, when I try to be a good boy, I try to kind of get in bed and go to sleep around like the 1030 mark or something. But when I do that at the moment, I just can't actually fall asleep. And it tends to be around like the midnight, half past midnight sort of time where I, I think I'm actually falling asleep. And then I'm waking up quite late in the mornings and I'm feeling really, really tired still, not kind of like fresh. Let's get out of bed and, and attack the day. Not at all. But I went to Miami recently and the five hour jet lag there it was put me in the perfect sleep routine. So I was feeling very tired. That's around nine o'clock at night. And it's kind of grinding almost to stay awake to about the 10 o'clock mark. And I was waking up naturally without the alarm clocks around seven in the morning. And I felt amazing. So I've kind of proven to myself that I can actually get the perfect sleep routine in. So just for the last question, then um, anyone who's kind of like having this problem or something, I'm sure there's loads of people. Um, if you're in a bad sleep routine, is there a way to sort of do like a factory reset to sort of simulate what I had with the jet lag? Or is flick fixing a sleep routine a case of slow and small changes over a long period of time? Yeah, Louise, so that's a really well documented um, effect when people travel in that direction and, um, and find it a little bit easier to acclimate. 
Um, there's a couple of different reasons for that. We don't have time to go over the natural endogenous uh, circadian rhythms of humans and how that relates to the 24 hour uh, sleep or the 24 hour cycle as dictated by the sun, right? Um, but what I'll say is one of the most uh, common um, sleep coaching techniques is to do sleep restrictions, right? So a lot of times um, people, especially if they're napping, right? Here's the downside to napping, right? If they are getting too much sleep or their perception is they're not getting enough sleep and so they stay in bed a lot more and they actually end up um, not uh, accumulating as much sleep pressure as they, as they need to feel sleepy. Now, uh, one of the techniques is to sleep restrict. And so in sleep restriction, we might take uh, a normal eight or nine hour sleep period and reduce it to six hours, right? So what that does, if we wake up at, <clears throat> if we wake up at a certain period of time, spend the entire day awake without any napping, uh, we're going to build up that adenosine. We're going to build up that sleep pressure. And there's a, some other tips and tricks I can offer. Uh, get some sunlight, uh, reduce the screen usage before bed. This stuff all impacts uh, our sleep function. Uh, but if we can get a full day, build up that adenosine, and then go to sleep, sleep restrict, only get six hours of sleep, wake up and do it again. A lot of times you'll self-correct, right? You'll self-correct. And then once you start going to sleep effectively and feel, you know, restored, maybe a little bit sleepy because you are being sleep restricted, um, then you can start to expand that six hour sleep period to six and a half, seven. Uh, but, you know, be consistent with the sleep time and wake times, build your plan and follow it. Um, but that is very, very effective because uh, a lot of times people are getting more sleep than they think they are. Um, and a lot of times they're, you know, dissipating some of that adenosine buildup by taking naps and they're not really sure why that impacts them. So the, the goal in the sleep restriction is to really build the sleep pressure so that you feel like going to sleep when it's bedtime. And once your body feels that and it becomes a trigger, um, then you can rest easy knowing that you're having a low sleep latency, you're falling asleep quickly. And most of the time, your body will do what it's supposed to do and give you, you know, as long as you're not drinking before bed or taking sedatives, stuff like this, right? You fall asleep naturally, your body knows what to do. And it should give you deep, see, uh, deep sleep, REM sleep, go through all the cycles, and then you wake up feeling refreshed. That's the target. Excellent stuff. That's great info. I'm going to definitely have a better look into that and um, hopefully apply some of that stuff. But um, yeah, that has been uh, four questions done for today. And before we wrap it up, it is time for what I like to call the shameless plug. So Rob, feel free to take a minute and promote anything that you're working on, the website, the foundation, your Instagram, just send my people where you want them to go to see your stuff. Yeah, so I just opened up my private practice. So I am taking on a couple of private clients if you're struggling with sleep and you want to work with me directly. Um, it is Sleep Genius. It's S L E E P G E N I dot U S. Uh, clever little play on uh, <laughs> the web address there. Um, that's my private site, and that's how you get to work with me. I also run a nonprofit that focuses on veterans and first responders here in the United States. We have put uh, some people through the UK and Canada through the program. Uh, so we're open to that. It's not a primary focus, but that is 62r.org, 62r.org. That's 62 Romeo. It's a beautiful thing that we put together as a nonprofit uh, to help people. And those are my main two plugs. Um, anybody can find me at Sleep Genius on any of the regular uh, social media. And that's all I got. Awesome. Thank you very much, Rob, for joining me today for the Talk 4 podcast. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thanks, brother. It's been a good one. And thank you guys for listening. This has been episode 71. And if you'd like to listen to the past episodes, go and have a look at our channel. And if you'd like to listen in for the future ones, make sure to hit that subscribe button and spread some love by leaving a like and a comment. Signing off for now.